we are facing some incredible challenges in our child care program. These challenges include both the immediate future, the balance of this fiscal year, and the coming, uh, and the coming 2016 fiscal year. Ceci and her team will be presenting both the nature, both the, the nature of this crisis, both short and longer term, and some of the strategies that we are proposing. I really do recognize that all of us are experiencing what one colleague has called advocacy fatigue. But I also know that unless we can really pull together strategies, information, and organizing, we really will face some incredibly tough situations for working families in Illinois and for the people who take care of their children to enable them to go to work. So please, let's be smart, let's be strategic, let's work hard, let's make sure that we engage our parents, we tell their stories, we communicate with our newspapers, we hold our elected officials accountable to the children and their working families across this state. So I'm going to turn it over to Ceci and team, and again, thank you all for being on the call and for all the incredible work that you will be doing in the coming months. Hi folks, this is Sethi Nyman, Vice President for Policy at Illinois Action for Children. Um, it's great to have all of you with us this afternoon. I wish it were to announce some great new um, advances in our field, um, and unfortunately it's not. Um, but I do want you to know that we have close to 300 out of the 500 that are registered for this call. So clearly this is, um, the word is out that there are things to do, um, and so I'm excited that that all of you are engaged and connected and um, looking for more information. Um, it is so critical, particularly in these times, that we work together, um, that we have a unified message, that we all stay to a unified strategy, um, and we're um, in the process of developing that. And, and so we wanted to, to share some things um, about what we know and also kind of what we, what we think and understand based on conversations um, what that means for, for you as the provider field, um, and most importantly for parents and, and, and their children. Um, we um, already received a number of questions, so that will inform our comments and as we go through and address some specific questions at the end. If you have questions, you can email them in. We have somebody who's fielding those questions, um, but we're going to go to the end of the presentation. It's not particularly long, um, and then we'll address questions towards the end. So, that's the logistics. Um, so let's get started um, in terms of what we're really calling the child care funding crisis. Um, let me just close this. Let me just work on my screen a little bit. Um, there we go, because I think you can see that. So um, okay, my slide did not advance. Funny how that always happens, isn't it? Let's see. There we go. So state budget and revenue. Um, all of you know we have, um, you know, some of the fatigue maybe that Maria referenced is because we work on early childhood and as part of that work we have for many years been working on revenue. Um, and so that, that issue um, really continues to plague us and will continue to define a big part of our advocacy work going forward. Um, so just to remind you, um, in case the long holiday season wipes it out of your brain, um, the state income tax that we've experienced um, at a 5% level since 2011, you'll remember at that time in the height of the recession and, fund and funding crisis across the state, we were able to implement, pass a bill that created a temporary income tax rate of 5%. Um, that expired. Um, it was written into the bill that it would automatically go back um, to 3.75 on January 1st of 2015 unless we legislatively continue that, made that rate permanent, or at least extended that currently existing bill. That did not happen um, last session, nor did it happen in the fall veto session. Um, and so, in fact, that tax rate did go down to 3.75. The impact, the immediate impact on this year's budget is significant. This year's budget, the fiscal 15 budget, which we're about halfway through, um, is about $2 billion lower than what's needed to maintain the current level of program. If you remember, and this will become important later um, in our conversation, you'll remember that mo the state was, was, um, did not have revenue at the end of the legislative session in May. Um, they passed a budget based on kind of one-time 
um, funding sources, some quick fixes, moving some unexpected money around to fill gaps, and they were able to pass the budget. But knowing that that budget was not adequate for a full 12 years of the coming fiscal year, but again, the sense was that revenue would be addressed in the fall veto session. And so programs and departments were told to continue to spend as is, um, to not make any programmatic cuts that, that we would come up with that additional revenue needed to maintain current levels of services. Because the revenue package um, did not appear in the veto session, that um, we do not have enough revenue to make it through the end of the fiscal year. So, so the current budget, and this is the entire state budget, not, not specifically the child care budget, the entire state budget, um, our general revenue fund, which is the state's checking account, so to speak, is $2 billion lower than what's needed to, to maintain the current levels of services that we currently deliver and did last year. Um, in addition, there continues to be a historical backlog of bills. That was one of the big motivations to actually pass the um, temporary income tax increase was because we had significant, over I think at the time, over six or seven billion dollars of unpaid bills. We were able to bring that down significantly because we had that higher income tax, but we still have a backlog of unpaid bills. So this $2 billion shortfall in our currently existing fiscal year will simply add to that growing um, pile of unpaid bills. Um, so again, lawmakers took no action. There was no, um, no interest in, in, in moving any revenue forward in the fall veto session. And so this week we have a new administration, we have a new gover governor, and it is, it is unclear kind of how, 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 how we will proceed as a state in terms of the revenue crisis that we all um, know that we have. Oops, sorry, I think I skipped the slide. So taking it down specifically to child care. So child care, again, um, we have to remember back to May. It was warm. Um, we were excited because the end of session was near. Now we're looking at the beginning of a new session. Um, child care um, was so in early May, we, we knew that we, we did not um, get a fair tax through a constitutional, or did, we're not successful in moving our constitutional amendment bill forward to amend the state's constitution to move from a flat to a progressive tax. So that we knew was unsuccessful in May. We also then quickly realized by the middle of May that there were not enough votes um, in the House chamber to pass a revenue package. And so th then we set about, the legislature set about um, cutting budgets um, where they could and, and, um, and also finding some alternative revenue scenarios that might work in the short term. So as part of that process, child care was in fact cut um, at the end, a hard cut at the end of the, of the legislative session in May that dictated our current fiscal year budget. That hard cut was $84 million um, from our previous year's appropriation. So $24 million was an actual cut, plus there were $60 million in the proposed governor's budget that was included in, in his proposed budget because we knew that we had seen um, that, that, that the program had grown in, in both cost as well as size, and so we needed to kind of adjust what our maintenance budget looked like. And so there was a $60 million included in the governor's proposed budget that would be annualized, plus that, wasn't, that didn't happen, that was cut, plus the additional $24 million cut. So a total of $84 million cut in May from child care. What that means is, um, so let me just go through my bullet points. In addition, the, every year when, when they do budgets, they have to anticipate an increase in caseload growth, um, and so they have to figure out the cost impact. So every year, our, you know, if we assume caseload growth, we also have to assume an increase in, in the, need, the, the amount of money needed to support that program. Um, so, so in addition to $84 million of a hard cut, we knew that we were, that we were going to have additional expenses as a, as a program because of increased caseload. Um, we also know that there has been movement, a kind of consistent and gradual movement of children from licensed exempt care into centers, um, into center-based care, and particularly among infants and toddlers, children birth to three. So they're really moving from the lowest, the lowest rate to the highest rate of care, um, and there is a cost impact there in our overall budget. Um, and then, in additionally, there was um, contractual obligations with the Service Employees International Union for rate increases, and across the board, the governor had made. Um, a commitment to lower co-payments um, over a period of 18 months, and so there, there still needed to be one co-pay reduction that happened in this fiscal year. So again, both of those issues um, were going to um, have a cost impact. So a total, um, the, the department will use $190 million. All that totals up to about $190 million um, based on their estimates at the time. 
that, that we did not get for child care at the beginning of the fiscal year, but that we knew at the time was needed to fully fund the program at its current levels for 12 years. I mean, for 12 months, sorry. So we started off the year not so great. Again, there was a commitment um, that revenue would be addressed in the fall, and so it would, you know, that this problem would be addressed then, um, if that didn't happen. In addition to what we kind of knew the scenario was, in addition, as, as you all know, the, the electronic case management system that was implemented a year ago this month by Department of Human Services to go towards a, more of an electronic case management system um, the, um, has not worked as well as had been hoped. There has been a number of, of kind of um, problems and delays along the way. That has resulted in the Department of Human Services doing what is basically called presumptive eligibility, meaning that the backlog, the, the processing was so slow, the system didn't work as, as it had been predicted um, and planned, and so families have been given automatic redetermination for really the last, an entire, an entire um, calendar year of 2014. That has led to an increased cost per month of the program to maintain the program, um, and that was unexpected, um, and it simply adds to our shortfall in the child care budget so the total math really takes us to about a $3 million shortfall in child care um, that we will need to maintain the program at current levels for the remainder of this fiscal year. Um, the, um, the traditional way that we would address this mid-year is that the Department of Human Services would ask for a supplemental. Um, and they, in fact, you know, had conversations before veto session about the need, made very clear to the General Assembly um, that, that this was a need um, and unfortunately, the supplemental was not, did, did not move forward. Um, and so we, we kind of missed the opportunity as a state to address this crisis before it became a crisis. Um, let me make sure I get the slide again. Um, so um, it's, it's a complicated math story, but at the same time, it's, it's kind of simple. It's, it is basic math. Um, it is unfortunate. We, as you probably know, um, in Illinois have never gone to a waiting list for the child care assistance program since we created it in its current form in, in 1996 as part of welfare reform. Um, we constrict the program based on our eligibility requirements, and so we have an income eligibility guideline. We have criteria in terms of being able to access the program, but as long as you meet those criteria, you have been allowed to access the program or access a subsidy to support um, your you know, families paying the cost of care. We, we know that we are so late in the fiscal year that there are very small, there, there really aren't any small tweaks, programmatic tweaks. We can't, we can't do something you know, to co-payments or we can't, we can't kind of adjust the program on the edges, so to speak, and make up for the shortfall that we have in the program. Um, let me tell you a little bit about how we actually have the dollars flow for child care in terms of how we pay for it. As you, I, I think I referenced earlier, the state has a checking account. It's what we call the general revenue fund. It is where our tax dollars go. It is where fees and other sources of income go at the state level. Um, and that is the state's kind of contribution. And that's where the state's contribution for child care comes from. The other dollars for child care come from really two primary federal sources. One is the TANF block grant, because we know that, that, um, that we're able to use TANF dollars to pay for child care. And the other source is the Child Care and Development Fund. Those two federal sources um, are pulled down on a monthly basis. So we, we use the term to pull down or draw, meaning that we have an account in Washington with Illinois' name on it. But we're only able to go to that account once a month. It's about right, right around the 15th of the month. And we can draw down our allotment. We are given an allotment for the, for the, for the federal fiscal year, um, and it's, it's about the same every month. So we combine the federal draw that we do on the 15th of the month with our general revenue fund, and as a result, we're able to always have a cash flow in hand so that we can pay bills as they arrive. When the, to date, we have, as we understand it, by and large, by the end of January, we will have expended all of the general revenue fund dollars because we've spent them as we've needed them, the federal money still remains because we can only pull down so much every month. So we can't kind of spend ahead of ourselves the federal because we're only allowed to draw down what we're allowed to draw down on the 15th of every month. 
So we do have the same allotment of our federal funds for the remaining of the fiscal year from the Fed. The problem is, is that amount of money is not enough to pay all the bills that come in in a month's time. In addition, because we're only able to draw down those dollars once per month from the federal government, we can't respond to bills as they come in. We can only respond to bills when we draw down those dollars and we now have money to write checks again, so to speak. Um, and so this creates kind of two, two problems, right? One is that you're automatically going to start to de delay payments because there's never going to be, because, because we're constricted as to when we can pay bills and it, it relies on this federal draw. And we don't control that. The feds have kind of given us that date, so to speak. Um, the other problem, of course, is that the, the dollars that we do draw down on the 15th of the month are never going to be able to pay all the bills that we have for one month services at the current level of services. So um, that is kind of the, the, big, the big if in terms of what that's going to look like, how that's going to be managed, um, and how do we kind of, what, what do we do with, with those two realities. Um, the understanding that we've had with a number of folks um, over the last month or two um, is because of the size of the shortfall, because of the length of time that we have left in the fiscal year is not um, 12 months, it's, it's really five months. Um, we anticipate that just in, in some way, shape, or form, the Department of Human Services will be forced to, to kind of shut down the program, so to speak. By, by saying shut down the program, um, we, we think that um, they would we assume, and again, we are not the Department of Human Services. They have not been, I, you know, they have not been um, told what what the plan is. That um, that we have a new administration that needs to make some policy decisions. They are just three days into their new jobs for those positions that have been filled, and so. But we really wanted to to come and and share what we know and what we think. So these are the what we think scenarios. Um, they are not facts. They are they are guesstimates. Um, so what we think will happen is the department will, will be forced to shut down the program. What we think that means is that no new applications will be accepted by resource referral agencies um, because the, the program can't kind of take in more bills, right? Um, in addition, that families, and you know that families are up for redetermination every day of the year, right? If they, you know, their six months starts the day that they, they get approved. and so. As families come up for redetermination, those families will also be notified that there are insufficient funds and that, that they cannot be redetermined, but that, in fact, their child care assistance will end at the end of their current, current period of eligibility. Um, that is, has never been seen before in Illinois. We don't, we don't really know how the, how the department would manage that. We don't know what systems are in place to be able to facilitate that. Um, and we know that um, there are two priority populations in terms of child care. In, in the state, one is TANF, TANF recipients are a priority population, and the other priority population are children with special needs. And so they would have to also be figured in to the, um, in, into how this would all be managed. So um, again, something that we've never seen before, you know, the, the, a number of years ago, some of you might, might remember that childcare was, in, in fact, short. I think it was about $73 million, um, and so we were forced to go to the General Assembly for a supplemental, um, and that was successful, and the General Assembly understood that we, that we needed that and why we needed that at the time, and there was bipartisan support to, to, to do that as part of the final budget negotiation. Um, you know, it's, it's a little less, um, it's a little more complicated now because behind every supplemental is a revenue source. Um, and we just um, diminished our source of revenue in the state significantly by $2 billion. And so there is very little taste, as we understand it, to have a conversation in the General Assembly and the Appropriations Committees about a supplemental until a conversation happens around a revenue package. Because the idea of passing a supplemental with no source of money to pay for it is simply digging the state deeper into the hole that we're already in. Um, it makes sense. Um, unfortunately, we were in the same position, uh, you know, a, a number of times over the last six to eight years, and we just kept not dealing with the structural deficit problem that we have in the state. We need to revamp our, our, our revenue systems. We need to in, um, really look at both the expansion of the sales tax as well as the amount of, of who we tax and what we tax. Um, and so because that has not been done to date, 
Um, we fear that, again, we don't know this to be true, we, we, we fear that a conversation around a supplemental mid-year for child care will be reliant on them first coming up with a package to discuss in the General Assembly regarding revenue. Um, so that's kind of what we know um, and in a nutshell. And I tried to break it down um, as simply as I could so that we, we always want to be conscious of not getting lost in policy seek. Um, but I think it, it, is, it is a very, very much a straight, um, you know, checks and balances type of situation. And unfortunately, we, we are so far down the road that the balancing of the situation seems um, a little um, hard to imagine without significant um, cuts. This is, we have to remember, this is all about our current fiscal year. Generally, when we go down to Springfield and we have a rally and we start to start talking to legislators, it's about next year's budget. But there's, it's very difficult for us to be able, and for them, to talk about next year's budget when this year's budget is in this type of situation. And so, as Maria alluded to, there is the short-term crisis that we have the short-term crisis could lead to a long-term crisis if we don't address 15, because then we can't address 16. There's really no way um, that that one doesn't doesn't kind of lead to the other. So we, you know, so our job becomes kind of doubly hard because we have to get them to focus on the immediate crisis at hand of the 15 budget, but we also need them to recognize the urgency as it relates to the 16 budget. Um, so we definitely have our work cut out for us. Um, I want to go over really briefly, this is very typical in, a, in an election year, um, that the General Assembly, the new General Assembly was sworn in on Wednesday. Our governor, as you know, was sworn in on Monday. Um, General Assembly was sworn in yesterday. They are not back in session um, until the House comes back in on the 27th of January for three days. Um, and then the Senate is not back in Springfield until the first week of February. So both the House and the Senate are in the first week of February. The governor will make a state of the state address, much like the president makes the president uh, a state of the union. Um, the governor will make a state of the state address on February 4th. Um, and that is to really do a broad kind of non-fiscal overview of his vision and plan for the state. Um, and then on February 18th is when he will lay out the budget that would support that vision. Um, and so those are our two big dates. But so we are a little, um, a little stymied by the fact that the General Assembly does not really reconvene as a full body until, the, until February 3rd. Um, and so we know that there can be no legislative action until then, and even then they would have to, something to, they would have, to have something to act on, and that's, that's unlikely. So, um, so we know that there was really nothing to be done with the legislature um, until in January other than to inform them and to engage them in a conversation about the value of child care. So I do want to um, talk about next steps. Um, I've, oh, I've kind of started down that road. I'm not very good at following these slides. Um, so one of the first things that we that we want to ask of all of you, because um, you know we we hate to take up lose an opportunity to ask you to engage um, with us or with with your legislators. So one of the things that we definitely want to do is use the media to really tell this story. Um, and so we're looking, we're really in, in embarking on a story collection um, project. And so we're asking all of you. Um, really, these are parent stories. Parents, you know, what will happen to the single adult who is a full-time student who relies on childcare to actually get that nursing degree, or the single parent who works, who really does, um, who works and needs childcare in order to go to work and has no support network or um, friends or family to to pitch in if they if they were to lose their assistance. Um, but, you know, really getting down to, and this is, you know, thinking about what is a reporter, how are they going to compel the readers to care about this issue? Um, you know, telling stories in terms of this is this is a family's co-payment right now. If they were if they were forced to pay the full cost of care, this is what they would pay, and that's actually more than they make in any given month or week. Um, so those are the type of stories we have identified. Some legislative champions in both chambers, both the Senate and the House, they are willing to work with us. And they're going to use their leverage with the media um, to really start to pitch some stories across the state. So we really want stories um, of parents. We also want, and we also want stories of providers, particularly the idea of what what what's going to happen when providers have delay of payments. What's going to happen when providers can't accept children who are walking into their programs to enroll 
because they, they, they can't have access to a child care assistance. Um, and so those are probably the stories that are con going to come a little bit more after, the, after any decision is made by the Department of Human Services, because I'm not sure how much the media is going to jump on the if, the what if stories. They need some actual program closures, program shortfalls, program lines of credit that, that you know, do or don't exist. Um, but for now, we really want to start to line up the, the kind of outline of some stories. And so we'd ask as we go down this road for you to be emailing, collecting and emailing stories to us um, with contact information to our, we've set up an advocacy, or this is our advocacy account, so it's advocacy at actforchildren.org. When we get those stories, we want a nice balance of, of different types of stories. We need a full spread of geography. We have 17 media markets in this state. We want to cover every one of those media markets. So if you send in a great story, but we don't call you, it's not because it wasn't a great story. It's because we got so many stories from that district. And we have to be balanced in terms of showing them, because there is not a legislative district in the state that doesn't have families that rely on child care assistance. And we need to convey that to our members of the General Assembly. Um, so we'll be working with you and the families that you connect us with um, on pitching these stories and you know, bringing cameras and, and reporters out to your programs. Um, if Anita Rummage is on the phone and the Rockford r and they did a great job last week. There was a great article in the Rockford Register Star on Monday that really kind of laid out the, the, the kind of looming problem and the potential impact. Um, and they got it right. And I think it was a really good story. And we need to have those hitting our, our media markets consistently throughout this crisis. We're also going to be developing lots of resources um, and collateral material for you. So template letters to the editor that you can all use to get your parents to sign, to get your school districts to sign. Um, you know, thinking about who in our community is really going to, you know, is going to draw the reader in. So, you know, even though you can tell the story, thinking about and asking yourself, am I the best person to send in this letter to the editor, or is the head of the PTA, or is the head of the, the economic development um, unit in, in our local government who thinks about folks not being able to go to work, or thinking about not educating our future workforce. So really thinking about who in your community could be submitting these letters, not just you or the individual parent, but really, this is an opportunity to engage folks in your community to be real champions and advocates. Um, um, so, oh, I'm sorry, I think I didn't talk about this one. Um, so I want to go over some dates. We definitely um, have, have filled our calendar a little bit to make sure that we have lots of opportunity to be connecting with you, to be hearing from you to be giving you information as we get it. Um, and so Thursday, coming up Thursday, January 22nd, we will have our first regional public policy caucus. It's, some of you may remember this is the year that we are shifting our structure to more of a regional focus, um, as opposed to just two statewide caucuses. We're going to do regional ones. Our first one of those is already sold out. Um, it's Thursday, January 22nd in Naperville. And we are absolutely beyond capacity, so we cannot take any more registrants for that. We still have space on Thursday, January 29th in Bloomington. Um, so if you're not already registered and confirmed for Naperville, we encourage you to come to Bloomington. Um, we will have Teresa Hawley from the Governor's Office of Early Childhood Development joining us for those meetings. Um, and again, we are trying to get as much information every day as we can in terms of plans of the, of the um, administration around this crisis. Um, we are organizing a legislative call-in day. Again, remember I told you that the House and Senate are not back in session until the first week of February. Wednesday, February 4th is the Governor's State of the State. We thought this was a good day, good day to catch them in Springfield. Um, to get your calls in, we, we will send you alerts leading up to that. We will give you some of the talking points. As always, we ask you to be courteous and respectful. We want you to be good representatives of early childhood. Um, but we really want you to convey the urgency of this issue and the importance that child care plays in their district. Remember, child care is a work support. It helps families go to work. It betters people's ability to support their families by getting more education and training. It allows that, that parent who doesn't have a GED to go back and get that GED. And it also allows parents to go to work every day, whether it be the gas station, the Walmart, the Target, the legal, the legal secretary, the nurse's aide, whatever it might be. This is the program that helps them do that. It also is a significant child development tool. And you all know this. Um, this is part of our early learning system. This is what's going to make kids ready to hit kindergarten and be successful in school and in life. 
um, and it's a critical part of that larger system and we have to support it. Um, so we, we will send you things, but look for that for February 4th in terms of a legislative call-in. We'll be having you call their Springfield offices. Um, Child Care Rally Days, as many of you know that we usually do a May rally, um, but this is not most uh, the, um, a mo like most years. And so we, are, we have scheduled a rally every month. Um, so our first will be Thursday, February 19th. That is the day after the governor's budget address. Um, and so we want to be prepared. We have the rotunda reserved, so we will be inside. It seems a bit of a, of a, um, a risk if we were to schedule outside. And so we do have the inside rotunda reserved for a rally day. And so we, were in, we are encouraging folks to plan on coming down to Springfield to rally for the fiscal, fiscal 14 or fiscal 15 this year's child care budget. Um, and so that's our first one. The next one is scheduled for Wednesday, March 11th. Of course, our Spring Into Action Conference and Rally Day is April 21st and 22nd. So always as a part of that gathering, we go to the Capitol on the second day. So we will do that and maybe make it more into a, a formal rally as opposed to just going over and finding our legislators. We might um, kick it up a little bit this year. Um, and so um, those are the things that we have in, um, in, in the works. In the meantime, we always, always encourage you to go and visit your legislators while they're in district. We know that they're not in Springfield right now. They got sworn in yesterday. The parties are finished, and they're coming back home today. They will be home if they're a house, in the House of Representatives. They'll be home until the final week of uh, January to go back down on the 27th of January. Um, and so they're home. They're in their district, so go find them. If they're new, go and introduce yourself. Invite them to your programs. Um, you know, bring a parent who uses the child care assistance program so they can tell their story firsthand. Um, go by and drop some information. We'll be sending, um, we have a fact sheet that will be available. We'll have some more things probably um, specifically geared towards um, from a parent perspective ready for our caucus next week. So we'll have some materials for you, but absolutely use the next couple of weeks to go and find your legislators in their district offices and to introduce yourselves, to reacquaint yourselves if you've met them before to introduce them to your program and the families that you serve, and to really make sure that they understand the importance of child care in their district and the, the, the devastation that's going to happen if this program is shut down. Um, on, our, on our website, we, and we you know, revise these all the time, our community profiles, that is a district by district breakdown of the dollars that go into each legislative district for the different parts of the early childhood program. So that will show you exactly how many child care assistance dollars are used in that legislator's district. That is critical information because at the end of the day, most legislators don't understand how many families rely on child care. Um, and so that's really a critical tool um, to see the number of families and specifically the, 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 number of the, the amount of money that goes into their district. So really using the time that we have in front of us in the next couple of weeks to do the in-district work. Um, again, respectful. Um, many of them don't know about the crisis. Don't so don't approach them mad that you can't be mad at them for something that they don't know anything about. It's our job to tell them about it and to explain it in a way that, that they understand and they can appreciate from where they sit in terms of understanding the impact that it has on their district. Um, so I'm going to stop there. That's the presentation. I hope I have not um, overwhelmed you and, and not confused you. Um, I'm going to start with a couple of the questions that we had emailed prior to us. I tried to work in. Um, answers based on some of the questions that we had received in, in my presentation. Um, I mean, so, you know, what is the impact on providers? I, I think I've made that clear. It's a, it's a potential delay of payments, but it's also a dwindling caseload in your, pay, in your, in your programs in terms of you're not going to be able to, re, to, to accept new families through child care assistance, and those families who are up for redetermination are not going to be able to continue on the program. And so, you know, if you have a class, if you, don't, if you have a full classroom right now, in a couple months' time, you might you might not, depending on how, how those families are redetermined in terms of how that falls on the calendar. Um, so the impact on providers is going to be significant. The impact on parents is going to be um, significant. Um, you know, somebody asked, should you continue to take child care assistance for program families? Absolutely. The program has not been shut down. We have not received any formal communication in terms of what the, what the plan is. Um, and so as long as we are accepting applications, absolutely you want to accept families who need care and who qualify under the current eligibility standards. Um, you know, we absolutely have to involve families in, in, this, in this advocacy campaign, and we know that, that they care about the programs 
that they that they rely on um, and they love their kids. And so I think it's not going to be that hard to get them involved. But we really rely on you all to engage and communicate um, and explain this to your families and to really help them understand wh how can they be involved. Um, so that's the job on us and then and then on you as well. And so we re rely on you to be uh, the effective advocates that we've always been. Um, you know, somebody asked about a lasting, you know, solution to our, 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 our revenue issue, and that, that's a, a very good question. Um, we hope that we can start to address that as a state, um, but all we can do is continue to advocate for that as part, of, as part of our larger strategy to support children and families and make sure that we as a state offer the programs and support that those families need to be successful. Um, but, you know, and so we are absolutely part of our larger coalition of the Responsible Budget Coalition and others who are really pushing the conversation on revenue. Um, the funding for Accelerate is part of a larger DHS budget. There's also dollars in the Race to the Top grant. Remember that the Race to the Top grant, and there are some initiatives and projects through that that are federal funding. Um, in, in overall, it should not affect that. There has been a temporary executive order in terms of a freezing of all, of all expenditures, so to speak, um, for review. But at the end of the day, the, the federal money is, is, you know, pays for some parts of the Accelerate. But for sustainability reasons, that is an embedded program in the Department of Human Services. And ultimately, that is also a key part of, of the way that the, that the program is funded. Um, and so it does affect it. It's unclear, you know, how, how, that, how that will shake out in the end. Um, we've talked about the actions to take. We've talked about that we're developing materials, and then we will get to you. Um, we are trying to record this call. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. We're still um, working our way through the, the owner's manual. So, um, but if it's, if it's available for broadcast, it will be on our website. Um, and so those are the questions that, um, that we've received to date, I think. Um, we, you know, as um, the resource referral agencies, for those of you on the, on, the, on the call, I think you have an incredible role to play in your communities in terms of being a resource um, and source of information. And, um, and so we will definitely be developing resources that are, that are geared towards you as well, as well as the resources that are geared specifically for parents. Because I think it's important that we lay out the problem from the lens of, of the audience. So providers from one perspective, parents from another, and resource and referral agencies from another. So we will absolutely be working on that. Um, I agree. I mean, some people sent in some comments, and I think it's a really good um, messaging for when you go and visit your legislators, or if you talk to reporters, or you're talking to people at your church and your neighbors, is to really frame this in, you know, if we're all invested, and if this administration and our legislature is always talking about how do we grow Illinois' economy. I mean, um, it's an important conversation for us to have as a state. We absolutely need a strong economy so that families have jobs, that families have jobs that pay well enough. Um, by, by removing the child care from those working families' lives is not really the way to, to grow an economy because what you're going to have is, is kind of chronic absenteeism from families, who, from parents who can't go to work because they're, they're faced with the choice of leaving their kids home alone or going to work. And so I think we're going to see an increase of absenteeism. We're going to have very erratic work behavior. We're going to have a churning of people going in and out of work. We're potentially going to see an increase of families going on to TANF or trying to get on to TANF or some other support system. Um, we know that there are exemptions for, for, for TANF recipients in terms of the work requirement if they don't have, if they don't have access to the child care um, for infants and toddlers. And so we know that, um, that we could, in fact, see an increase of, of folks on the TANF, on the TANF program. So, um, so those are some of the comments. Those are some of the questions. Um, I hope I've answered your your questions, and um, and then let me see if there are other questions that have come in, or if folks are sending questions in. Hi, hello everybody. This is Samir Tana from Lone Action for Children. Um, I just want to reiterate a couple things because I see the comments coming in. Um, we will put the presentation on the website, um, and as Ceci said, if the recording works out, that will also be on the website. Um, we will try to, we'll send that out to everybody in an alert. If you receive the invitation to the webinar, you will also get um, a notice that, that the materials are available online. Um, people are also asking about something to give out to parents. Um, we are finalizing a fact sheet 
that will essentially have a summary of this presentation on the front and the actions you can take on the back. Um, and that will be available beginning at our caucuses, and we will also post that online as well. So I just want to make sure that you all know what, what we're going to be sending you um, in the near future. Um, so I don't know, I don't see any questions, but Maya, I don't know if, if I don't see them and you see them. Hi, this is Maya. There actually are quite a few questions coming in. Um, the webinar technology allows us to print these questions through a report. So I'm thinking that it probably would be best if we took some time to kind of categorize the questions that have come in and then send out a summary. Okay, so we can um, do that and, and if you're registered for this call, you'll get that summary in, in the, to answer the questions that have come in in real time during this presentation. Um, Samir mentioned again the fact sheets that we're developing and those will be available as of next week. Um, we, you know, we, as I mentioned, we do have some, we are working with some legislative champions um, but there, we can never have enough. Um, and so we hope that you reach out to your legislators once you have the information um, and the talking points from us and, and um, you know, can, but you can already start to call and make those appointments with them um, in the next couple of weeks and already plan the February 4th call in. So we'll be getting those materials with you as well. But there is already stuff to do, but I, I, I really do want to reiterate this is based on information that we've had in terms of the budget situation, and this is this is our understanding of of the of the actions that the department might have to take in order to address this funding crisis. None of this has been determined. No announcements have been made that the child care system is shutting down. So I want to be really clear in terms of how you communicate to legislators. We don't want to get our friends in DA, at, at DHS in trouble. Um, they have not said this. This is not a DHS webinar. This is an Illinois Action for Children advocacy webinar. This is our, our, our hope to, to engage you in the conversation, to give you information that will be helpful, to kind of stop you worrying about things that we have no control over and worrying about things that are maybe not true because they've been kind of passed through the grape line. So we've told you the budget numbers. We've tried to provide as much fact as we have access to. And then we've tried to assume, based on some other conversations that we've had and just understanding how fiscal years work, um, and the larger context of what's happening in Springfield, what might happen. Um, so I just want to really reiterate that this is not fact in terms of the child care program is quote unquote shutting down. We don't know that. We're waiting for a policy decision to be made. We need the new administration to have the time to look at the reality of the funding crisis and then to kind of assess their options and make some, some, um, some decisions. We can, however, be building support for this program every day between now and whenever that decision is made. Um, and so that's what we're hoping we leave you with today is to go out, promote the child care assistance program, promote the role that it plays in our economy, promote the role that it plays in, in creating a really good um, uh, early childhood system, that it helps kids get, re you know, get ready for school, um, and that it really does help their parents go to work and go to school and stay working. Um, and so that's what we can do in the short term. So I want you to focus on the kind of focus on the positive activity that we can do to support the program and promote the program and to build champions out there for the program. And then once, once, if and when a crisis hits, then we'll be able to kind of point specifically to the negative impact that it has on our communities. We're not there yet, so let's focus on the reality and what we can say to be true right now, which is child care keeps Illinois working. So thanks everybody. Have a great afternoon, um, and we will get um, we will summarize the, the questions and answers and get those back out to you as soon as we can. Signing off. <laughs>